Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the River City Midtown. Good morning to the River City Board of Commissioners Workshop, um, November 28, 2023. First item of business is a presentation of the 2023 annual report for Stormwater Director Stormwater Ariel Blanton will address. Good morning, Ariel. Happy day. Hey, good morning. Hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Make sure everybody can hear me well. All right. So I'm pleased to present the 2023 Stormwater Utility Report. Let me make sure I can get this. There we go. All right. So the purpose of this report is uh, not only it's required by the state of Georgia through the EPD uh, for our stormwater management permit, but I also think it's a great opportunity uh, for you all to see just kind of highlights of what our department has accomplished throughout the year. There we go. All right. So there's three different categories. It's going to be administration, environmental monitoring, and operations. So starting off with administration, uh, Georgia EPD, uh, every five years, they come and do an audit of our stormwater management program just to make sure we're on track with our permit and that we're doing everything that we're required to do. Um, after providing documentation and having a field visit, they looked at things such as storm drains, ditches, pipes, and detention basins. And after meeting with them, showing them how we do our inspections, they were pleased that everything checked off. They even mentioned that they were impressed with our practices against other municipalities that we were pretty much ahead. So that was good to hear. Also, we had our watershed protection plans for the Potato Creek, Shoal Creek, and Cavern Creek watersheds. We have a consulting group, Tetra Tech, that's currently in the works of doing that. They're about 65% complete right now. Uh, these are important. Uh, because they develop strategies that address water quality issues in our community and kind of give us an idea of moving forward, what we can do to make that even better in our future. We also have a program called the CRS, which is Community Rating System Program. Right now we are a class six. This program is kind of a benefit, it's an extra benefit to our community uh, for floodplain management. Uh, this is something that we include education practices, we provide mapping, we provide all these resources so that any homeowners or anyone that has property in the floodplain, they have an idea of what the floodplain is, the function of it, why it's there, and also things that they can do to, to decrease uh, their chances of any flooding in the future. And because we're a class six, we also give a, excuse me, not we give, but uh, policyholders when these insurance companies can get a 20% discount. So that's a, pr a pretty good benefit for our community. Also, we had interns, had two interns over the summer, and because of the storm damage that happened, we thought normally they go and do stream walks, kind of look at any erosion problems we're having, but also we thought this will be a benefit to look at any trees that were falling to make sure we're not having any blockages, then that way there's no other flooding issues down the line. So they were to go and assess that, make some marks, and we were able to go back and um, fix anything that we needed to. Also, they assisted in water quality sampling. You can see a, a neat photo of them right there. They went out with us for about uh, eight different sampling events. It's an all-day event. They worked really hard, but it's also a good learning opportunity for them as well. On the environmental side, we were pleased to celebrate 31 years as a tree city, and we also recognized our former arborist, Craig Jenkins, who retired after 17 years of service with the city. Uh, Batilla Tree Farm donated over 800 trees for our citizens so that we could replenish the community after tornado damage this year. We are very grateful for them to do that. We were also able to hand out those trees at the Flint River Regional Library. There were 217 water quality samples from various points throughout the city's watersheds. We we're looking at water quality and effectiveness of our non-point source pollution program. We also engaged in 29 outreach educational programs, range from in-class elementary programs, teacher workshops, staff, and adult education. There were 800 erosion control inspections, 
and we had two community cleanups. One of them was at the reservoir in the spring, and the other one was throughout different areas, which is our stream, stream cleanup. It was throughout different areas of our city. We had over 120 volunteers and over 3.5 tons of trash with all of those cleanups combined. On our operations side, our crews cleaned and maintained over five miles of ditches, 3,000 storm drains, and two miles of pipes. Also, there were 90 work orders completed. And there's some projects of note that we like to point out. These are the highlights of what happened throughout the year. So, of course, we had tornado damage that took up a good, uh, a good half of our year. Uh, we were able to remove over debris from over 800 storm drains, replace five drain lids that were crushed by trees, and we replaced 110 feet of pipe that was pulled up or damaged from the tornado earlier this year. And I will say this was the first time we have ever seen a tree pull up, the roots pull up a pipe out of the ground. I want to say that happened in two different areas. And it was, it was just pretty, pretty wild to see. On East Tinsley Street, we replaced 100, 180 feet of pipe due to sinkholes, sinkholes forming um, along kind of the line of where the pipe would be. This was due to failure of, of metal pipe, which is what was put in years ago. But over time, it rusts, it degrades, and it can cause dirt to accumulate and, and create sinkholes. So now we are using a high-grade plastic pipe. It is a high-performance polypropylene pipe. Basically, all that to say it's a plastic pipe. It's, it's going to last for over 50 years, and it's just a really good product. So we use that. I mean, it's more durable throughout our projects. The public detention pond rehabilitation. We had two of our publicly owned detention basins that were in need of maintenance. We had some structural damage as well as uh, sediment accumulation that we needed to get out. So the first one is North Griffin Regional Pond, which is out there at Walmart. We put a lot of rock around our, our inlet structure where all the water was coming in from the urban development in the area. And Oakview Detention Pond, there's another outlet. that Your outlet is the structure that goes outside of our pond. That was also starting to deteriorate. Next one is going to be on Bell Street. Another situation of sinkhole swarming. A lot of this is due to the old infrastructure, metal piping, things like that that are happening. There's 80 feet of metal pipe that was replaced with 24 inch high grade the PP plastic pipe that I mentioned before. There was some blockage of runoff in that area, so this helped tremendously. On Ellis Road, there were ditches in front of several homes all down the, the strip across from the UGA campus. They were filled with sediment and driveway pipes were not draining water properly. So they were dug out and matted to move the water, to make the water flow more downstream. So those are just a few highlights we have. I cannot say how much I am just proud and honored to be part of this team. Everyone strives every day. Every individual brings something to the table. They strive for excellence. We communicate. We have fun, but we get the job done. And um, it's just, it's just, I'm very confident that our city is in good hands with the team that we have. Any questions? I think your team is here as well. Today. They are. Yes, they are. They're right there in the back. We like so thank you. Yeah. Very good. question to board now? Yes. You said we were up to six. Once it's getting... It goes from one to 10. 10 being the 10 is where you start off. You, you, you say you're part of the National Flood Insurance Program. That's where you're at. Number one is the best, but that's going to be for your coastal communities. So, us being in between a six and five range, that's re really good for the Piedmont area of Georgia. There's only so much we can do. Coastal communities can implement more practices more than we could. Do they know that we're level six? The, and most of them do. We've worked with them on this program to reach out and say, hey, this is what we are. And usually if homeowners will reach out to their insurance provider, then they mention that and they work through the National Flood Insurance Program to get that. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, item two is discuss possible amendments to the Unified Development Code to allow chicken keeping with conditions for purpose of companionship and or egg production as an accessory use in all residential zoning classification. Kelsey Card, the staff attorney, will be back. Welcome back. Good morning. So I did not prepare a presentation today because my hope is that we will have some open dialogue um, about our previous draft that was presented to the board um, that was not adopted. Uh, but my understanding is that we have some ideas. I wanted to let you know kind of what we've been doing in the meantime to uh, discuss and try to resolve uh, or, or come up with more ideas uh, for how to resolve some of the concerns that were mentioned. Um, since it was last presented, I know one of the concerns was that you know, what do we do if we have chickens that are getting out because they we don't have an ordinance for seizing chickens and our, you know, animal shelter does not take chickens. So what sort of mechanism will we have for enforcement uh, as far as, you know, removing animals from a home or a facility that should not be there? Um, I have reached out to Marietta, Roswell, and Milton, which all have chicken ordinances uh, that are very similar in style to the ones that were presented uh, with a few different changes that I'll get to in a moment. I have not heard back on how they handle that particular problem. Um, and I will say that one of the things that we kind of came to the realization of during housing council uh, within the last to uh, about two meetings ago uh, from Spalding County was actually that they were looking at the ordinance draft that we presented, but we were utilizing the ordinance draft that they had. Uh, and they said, well, we're having problems with roosters. So the county who who handles the animal shelter and also has, you know, more property seizure experience when it comes to the sheriff's department, um, specifically for evictions, did not have any a, a better process basically in place. So they were looking to us as well to say, how are you guys going to handle this? Um, so that is an ongoing concern that we have. One of the options that I think that we could consider um, would be to reach out to other groups, nonprofits, or organizations, but we would have to potentially contract with them separately in those circumstances. And because we don't know if or when that would be a problem that would arise, I don't know the the format of of those types of services, if it would just be call when we have a problem. Our, our, our charter does not necessarily work that way when it comes to, to our contracts and we could retain services, but if it gets up to a certain dollar amount, obviously it would have to be presented to you. So I do have concerns about that route as well, but I'm happy to pursue it. Um, one of the other uh, comments that was mentioned, I believe uh, the night that the ordinance was presented to the board was that we had received a, a recommendation for enclosures that were over the actual chicken coops rather than saying that they had to be in a fenced area and that they could roam around a, a yard. There's a question as to whether or not that means free range, uh, if free range is around a yard versus around wherever they want to go. Um, so we could also look into those types of options, but I, I also want to clarify that one of the concerns me and Chad had with our original draft was that we we are a very unique community. We are not Marietta, Roswell, or Milton, where we have large parcels. We have parcels that are sometimes a tenth of an acre. Um, we wanted to put in the caveat to make it where you could only have them on a quarter acre lot, I believe is where we set the minimum. Um, but we're trying to be mindful that there are areas of our community where a whole, a whole streets that don't have a parcel that is above a quarter acre. Um, and so we don't want to alienate a section of the community that may want to have chickens and we want to be mindful of that. But in order to be able to place buffer uh, criteria or limitations or certain fencing limitations where they would have to move in order to feed the chickens would have to move the coops around um, for, for grazing or what have you, cleanliness. Um, there's not a lot of room on some of these lots for that to be able to happen and not intercede into a neighbor's area. So. I, I want to kind of open up the floor with all of that in mind for ideas that you may have, um, and I'm happy to pursue them and research them more, but we really need a starting point from a staff perspective to determine what direction we need to go before we would consider presenting something else. Okay. Um, board members, do we want to proceed looking at other options or leave it as is and we're going to see the, the rejection of the chicken one? Leave it as in terms of no chicken. Okay. So. You said the county had problems with roosters, but we're not going to allow this. No, but they don't either. Their ordinance that they have had for years does not permit roosters, and they have a rooster problem. So I think that's where they were looking to us to say, what enforcement are you guys putting into place? 
because we, we want to see what's in yours. And, and they, they are also having that problem. So I, I think the answer is probably contracting with a company, but I don't know who does that. I don't know if it would be a separate farm. I don't know the legalities of it because it's, it's a little bit different for state law, because we, you know, we handle, they mention animals, but the animals and the seizures often go through magistrate court and the sheriff's department, they may seize dogs to take them to the shelter, but people aren't going to magistrate court for chickens. Um, at most, I think one of the other things that I've seen that was very common was horses, and that was for maltreatment, not they're in the street, um, and chickens are more likely to to be the ones that are going to roam. So I think that that's, it, it, it's, a, from my perspective, if no one has an answer for how we enforce it, that implies to me that no one is enforcing it and that people just kind of bite their tongues and say, well, that neighbor has a chicken problem and it's resolved private property owner to private property owner. Um, in an area that is as dense as us, we are a city, I don't um, see how we would make that work. Um, we're, we're, we're going to get complaints. I would need to research it more, but for horses, for example, that was the, the one common thing that came up. They would come out and they would seize and basically take the animals to a to a facility, but we would still be responsible for that animal, basically, until until it was disposed of, dealt with, returned, what have you. But um, I chicken ordinance says that we, don't, we you can't have chickens. Right. We do not allow for chickens, and that's done through our zoning. So, have we cited anybody for chickens? Yeah, we have told them that they have to be removed. Yes. We have, cited it by we have yes, yes, and we do it through through our zoning. So, essentially, when we come across people who have chickens in their backyards, if it's visible for code enforcement, or we're getting complaints from neighbors, that's the point in time where code enforcement will go out and let them know that it's a zoning violation. And the judge will tell them you have to remove the property or you have to remove the chickens from your property. Um, they have. Yes. And it, it, it because it's a zoning violation. So they have in, in court. Yes. In municipal court. So. On a slight calculation, how many people do you think have been fined for having chickens? I know that there have been two cases since I've been here. And in one of them, we did not actually have to do the fine because they removed the chickens prior to court, prior to the. The citation being presented to the judge. So, in calculation of having two fines, how much money do you think we've spent trying to get a chicken ordinance? Just my time <laughs> as staff. Just the same amount that we would spend on any other uh, on any other ordinance preparation. Okay. We right. had three free votes until it. So uh, what now? We have three free votes on the chicken ordinance. So, then it was a majority. The, the ordinance proposed was. Was denied. Yes. And so I believe my, Mr. Tinsley, myself, and I'm trying to remember who the other one was that voted. Rodney, did you vote for it? Or... Okay. And I, and I will be very honest that while I, I mean, I've been here about two and a half years at this point, and those are the two citations since I've been handling municipal court, which I think will be two years as of January. However, we have had many requests, which is kind of how it, this this came to be um, for people that code enforcement may have dealt with that never came to me because I only get I only get the situation once we have, you know, either a citation issued or if it's a unique situation. Um, and so the, there may be more that I do not know about that never came to court because they were resolved outside of court. Um, but we have had requests and calls that were made. So, so I didn't vote. So uh, they, what, what, whether we want to bring it back up or just drop it and be done with it. Bring it back up. Uh, I would recommend that any chicken doesn't have a wire which would help prevent them from being free range like they are on the Walgreens. Okay. And the people we decided uh, is they elusive? Is that the reason we knew? Because I know people in the city of Griffin who asked chickens and we closed it. Yeah, we have been very reactive to the problem. We have not gone out and and salt out yeah, chickens. Right. So we have the, the ones that I dealt with in municipal court were because we had complaints from neighbors. Um, the, I think it was two different people that I dealt with, one of which she did not have a rooster. She had four chickens and they were her pets and I hated it because 
it, it, I mean, it, she treated them better than most people treat their dogs, but unfortunately they're not allowed to see her and her, her neighbors were complaining. So we have sort of just handled it as we've had complaints. Um, but there are several chickens and that's sort of where the problem lies that we can't prove whose chicken it is if it's just walking down wall streets and nobody's going to take credit for it being a chicken. And so we, we really are sort of at a loss on how to enforce chickens. Because then we would have to seize the chicken, yeah. not know who it is. We have a responsibility potentially to notify the owner of that chicken before we dispose of it, do anything with it. But we would be paying for the chicken's care somewhere uncertain of where uncertain of how uncertain of the of whether or not we'd go to magistrate court to have to dispose of the chicken i do not know um which i think that is that is to me the bigger concern is um you know i i think that we can put into place a lot of things for people's concerns related to nuisances uh such as not allowing for the roosters but it's the enforcement that is is the bigger issue um in one of the one of the two cases that i had how we found out about the chickens was actually that the property had a general cleanliness problem so we were there on general cleanliness and code enforcement recognized that they had a, more than it was more than four chickens that were in the backyard and of course the argument that's made is this is my emotional support chicken and that my family you know these are my family's pets and there's egg production and there are a lot of benefits but i do have concerns about enforcement and when I look at an area like Marietta or Roswell or Milton, you're talking about they are dense and, and heavily populated, but those parcels are much bigger than quarter acre lots that we're dealing with here. Our current ordinance, to clarify, the only circumstance where you are allowed to have chickens is actually if you have a greater than a three acre lot that would be um, zoned as agricultural. And at that point, there's a limitation on how many you can have there. But the idea is that that's for business related purposes, not for residential egg production and and companionship or having chickens as pets we do not have an ordinance specific to exotic exotic pets generally all of this is handled through zoning so there are specific animals uh farm animals and obviously state law would handle wildlife animals um that that's governed by state law but no no, that again, that would be governed by state law for the most part. So we, we're preempted on on the wild animals, but when we talk about farm animals, bees, things of that nature, uh, that is all handled through our zoning ordinance. So basically, if you have a large enough lot and you are zoned to have it, you can have it. Um, currently, majority of the city of Griffin is excluded from permitted from being permitted of having those. Ms. Warren, if we want to bring it back up, you be the officials. Deciding vote, or we just let it be. Whether we bring it back up or not. I mean, I mean, if you want them, great. If you don't, then we're, we're good to go and move on. And... But to next time, I'm with them. I'm checking for them. Okay, so you're, 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 yeah. you're good with just leaving it in the city? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. It says so no, we're done with chickens. We're done with chickens. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay thank you. All right. Thank you. Item three is discuss the current state of the city of Griffin Schultz Creek landfill. Debbie Down. That's okay. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name's D Mays. I'm the landfill superintendent for the Shoal Creek landfill. And I'm here today to uh, give you an update on the status of the landfill. And we have uh, some expenditures coming up that, uh, we need to make sure everybody's aware of because they're quite large. Uh, so that's the purpose of this presentation, to make sure everybody's updated and to give us time to explore alternatives and uh, financing in bonds if, that we may need to uh, keep the landfill running and time so that we can be proactive and not reactive. Too many times we've been reactive when it, comes down to the last minute on these things. So uh, so here we go. Uh, remaining capacity report. Uh, we were requ required by the George EPD every September to submit a rem remaining capacity report. Uh, this year, uh, Paragon Consulting Group uh, submitted that report uh, on September 25th. Uh, the remaining life of the current landfill is 2.56 years. So that's a date of March 22nd, 2026. Uh, that has gone down quite a bit since last year. 
a lot of it has to do with the uh, storm damage we had, uh, stuff coming in. Also has to do with uh, our rates. We're one of the cheapest places to dump. We have people coming from all over the place to dump at our landfill. Uh, so right now, uh, if we uh, have to close the existing landfill, uh, we have to submit a uh, financial assurance report to the George EPD, and that was provided by uh, this uh, independent uh, accounting group, Malden and Jenkins, and on April, 20, April 11th, 2023, the cost were to close the existing landfill is a little over $3.3 million, Post-closure costs, which is cost for maintaining it for 30 years, is a little over $7 million. So we're looking at over $10 million for the landfill to close it and maintain it for 30 years. Right now, as of August 8th, the money we had on hand, the closure surcharge was $380,000, a little more. In the reserve was 664000 for a, well, did it go away? There it is. For a total of just over a million dollars. As you can see, we're nowhere near what we need for that. The new landfill that we're looking to, to open, there's quite a bit of expense associated with that. Uh, we have professional services, erosion control, grading, about uh, 622,000 cubic yards of dirt to move. We have to construct an entrance road. We have to put fencing around the entire landfill. Then we have to install water and methane wells. And right now, an estimated cost is three and a half to $5 million to open up the new site. That's on existing property? That's on existing property, yes, sir. It's uh, 50 acres uh, just to the south of where the uh, existing uh, site is right now, uh, landfill. Our equipment runs from 8 a.m. to about 4.15 every day, Monday through Friday. It's a, a, it's a harsh environment, what it runs in. So our equipment, when it tears up, it costs a lot of money. Here's just some examples. And all this is just since the fiscal year started. Uh, for... I, I, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. When you said that the, the cost to close for the closure of the landfill, if yes. we open a new uh, the new landfill, would we still have to close that or would that just become part of the new landfill. No, ma'am. The existing landfill would be separate from the new landfill. Right, so, so we have to close. We it. have to be. We have to close it. Yes, ma'am. Did Did that answer your question? On that, the closure was it closed for thirty years. You got like you said, you got a maintain for thirty years. That's why you got you have closure costs. You got post closure. Of course, most of the costs are going to be post closure, but you got to maintain it. And that 30 years, I'm sorry. It could it ever be it could never be used for anything else, could it? Uh, no, ma'am. And, and that 30 years as 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 long as nothing happens, if uh, we have to maintain the water wells and the methane wells, if any issue comes up with those, we have to correct them. And when we correct them, the time starts over. And the C and, and this is strictly on the C and D. This is C and D, right? And this is a C so and D landfill. Previous, not a central public landfill, but a trash landfill that we're concerned that we're currently monitoring. We have we have a closed C and D landfill, and we have a closed MSW landfill. Both of those are being monitored right, right. now, right? The the closed C and D landfill had a problem with the methane. And we had to spend a lot of money to uh, to fix that problem. We had to put in a, we had to run power poles to it. We had to put in a, a vent system to vent out the uh, the methane. 
many years do we have left on uh that we, did we have 30 years on each one of those 30 years on each one of those i'm not sure the exact date on the closed msw site but the the closed cnd site the methane problem we had just uh occurred about five years ago so the time started over oh okay And also, for those we postponed 30 years, we need to come back, expect them to be a bit. We need to change the actual actual impact of the plan. So, over the whole 30 years, we're still getting a year we expect. Right. That's why you have to I'm helping. How um, the, the money to come to pay for this, I know it, we don't have money to pay for anything up front. How where we get money from? The, the, the money uh is comes in what uh is charged across when you when you come across a scale. We have a right now it's uh, I think it's forty dollars and something a ton, but we have what they call fees. We have a dollar per ton closure fee, a dollar per ton local fee, and seventy-five cents per ton state fee. We have to send the state. At the, I guess it's the end of the year, uh, for whatever tonnage we brought in, it's, we have to send them. But the uh, closure fee goes into an account, and the local fee goes into separate accounts. Uh, and that's where that money is put. So all, all the money generated through the solid waste department? It's, yes, ma'am. But it's as you can see, it's not enough to yeah. cover. Was when they set up the separate accounts, the closure account was to make sure that they had money at the, at this time to be able to pay for this landfill. But a dollar a ton was not sufficient um, because we don't have a million dollars. We need at least three to get it closed, much less we could budget potentially for what we need to do each year for 30 years after. That's what we do currently with the closed CD label. We have a budget every year for that. But $3 million off the top, we, that should be in our closure account, but we've never. And I don't know how the dollar was determined. I don't know when it was determined, um, but it should have been more for us. So are we uh, are we one of the lowest in the area? Yes. Yes, I, I, gonna I, get, I, I'll get to that. I'll get to that slide. I'll say, well, we raised our rates and we're but we're 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 but uh, back to equipment. I just want to let you know our equipment it costs a lot of money. Costs a lot of money to repair it. Matter of fact, our compactor is down right now, and they're working on it. That'll probably be another five, ten thousand dollar bill on top of that. Uh, so we we get those expenses anytime because it's run a lot. Uh, we're looking at to close existing landfill, the lower three million. Uh, open a new one, three and a half to five. Equipment repairs over 134. Total expenses right seven to eight and a half million dollars we need gonna need. And if we include the post closure, we're looking at 14 to 15 and a half million. Now here's our gate rate comparison. Right now we're charging $40.27 per ton and the $2.70 per ton fees, that's what we talked about, a dollar. For the closure, a dollar local and seventy-five cents for state brings it to forty-three dollars and two cents. We have a minimum of twenty-five dollars per ton, and it's prorated based on weight. Uh, if you have less than a ton, Cedar Grove and Barnesville, they're forty-eight dollars per ton. They have a fuel surcharge. They have an environmental fee and an 8% sales tax. So their fee is $60.55 per ton. Uh, commercial customers have a $75 minimum. County uh, minimum is $28 uh, dollars for county people. Uh, what was that number? Wait, I'm sorry? You're good. Oh, okay. That, so that's the gate rate. Now, I didn't include Pine, uh, Pine Ridge down the road is $215 per ton.
Uh, we got all. On the bus timeline. Yes, sir. That's out there on Bailey Jester Road. Right. For the, the Baytrush 215 time for CBD. There's a 215 for coming across the scale, no matter what you have, waste, whether it's anything. I'm sorry, say that again. Yeah, but most people now have gone to a fuel surcharge. Yeah, yes. And just to let y'all know, the uh, we do have a policy, uh, City of Griffin, if you live inside the city uh, limits and you pay for garbage pickup, but well, if you pay for yard waste or garbage, you can, and you are a citizen, you can come to the landfill one time a week to dump either yard waste or uh, C and D, but it's once a week. So there, there's no charge if you're already paying for that. So please know when we're talking about rates, 99% of the customers are commercial customers that come in. We're not talking about, you know, lined up with citizens coming in. It's big roll-off trucks. Uh, so customers do you think are not local? They're not from Griffin. I'm sorry, say that again? Um, I, I, I heard you say earlier that we have a lot of people coming from other places. Yes, ma'am. What percentage of that do you think is people coming from out of the county or the, out of the city uh, uh, that's not local? Uh, uh, probably over 50%. We have people coming from Noonan. We have people coming from uh, Thomaston. We have because our, we're cheaper than anybody. But you're referring to commercial. 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 We do have Spalding County people come, and they. Uh, we only take C and D, and ever since the uh, collection center stopped taking bulky items, they come out and try to bring their bulky items, which we cannot take. And uh, it's caused the problem uh, with uh, our people getting cussed out by, by people because we don't take that stuff. So, uh, you mean like, furniture? like furniture and mattresses, we, we're not allowed to take that. We're regulated by the EPD. We can't take that. And so uh, when they find out we can't take it, they get upset and they vent on us. Is there anywhere in, in, in uh, Griffin, Florida kind of where they do take bulk? Yes, it can go to the Griffin Transfer Station. Okay. Yes, they can take it there. That's on Industrial Drive. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. Uh, alternative for closing existing landfill. There's a, a, a practice that they do it a lot up north. It's called landfill mining and reclamation. And it's the practice of uh, digging up existing buried trash. Uh, you get out things like concrete and metal. Uh, 
you then put the material through a screen and you separate out the dirt and any material that's left that has it decomposed, you run it through a uh, through a shredder to reduce the side and then re reduce the size of it and then you put it back in the landfill. Uh, it's big up north. And if we did that, the only additional piece of equipment we would need would be what they call a shaker screener. And they're about $415,000, give or take. We'd probably need to hire a couple of people. And we have an old Komatsu excavator that would need to be replaced. And the average cost to um, mine a landfill is $4.50 per cubic yard, which includes the cost of the equipment, labor, and fuel. And we are still in uh, talks with uh, our engineering group, Paragon, and the EPD to try to get answers on this for us doing this. Whether or not we have to get a new permit or if it's just a modification to our existing permit. And uh, my boss, Todd, uh, the director of solid waste, has been playing phone tag with the people at EPD on getting an answer for that. So uh, we're still trying to get answers on that. That's correct. It, it, it's basically we're trying to gain back airspace. Uh, some of the big bulky items uh, can now be put in a shredder and it reduces the size. So it, it, it allows for better compaction. Yes, yes, they do landfill mining. Yes, they do. They've been doing that for quite a while. Well, it, it depends on the material in the landfill. And it just, it, it varies. You can maybe get 50% back. Uh, the, the metal then gets recycled. The concrete the, thing gets... The, the concrete, we can... The concrete, we can, we can, uh, we got a concrete pile now. We've stopped putting concrete in the landfill. We've got a big pile of concrete. And we had in the budget to uh, rent a concrete crusher to provide our own gravel at the landfill for when it gets muddy on the work face. Uh, so that would be reusing that concrete to and do. The theory is if you raise the rates, it'll reduce the demand for our landfill. Possibly other folks can take other areas he, he, to go to. Yes, it, it would. And, and possibly extend the overall life. Yeah, slow, slow some things down. Uh, yes, I'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> I, I research and we just bought a new square. Did we not uh, last year or two? The shredder? Yeah. The shredder was bought. And we also had a, uh, we got an approval to increase the height. Yeah, yeah. Uh, space is the imaginary line that you got going from one to the sky, going from both sides. You can decrease that in Canada. Folks will get, that's why right now we're going to be years. Uh, but what really good is hard was Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, we also need to look at a, what they call a phased in approach to the new landfill. Uh, so what that would do is we'd divide it up into multiple sections. Uh, We'd only uh, prepare and grade one section at a time. Additional, well, there it goes. Additional sections would be prepared as needed. Uh, using this approach, I would reduce the initial cost to open up the new landfill. Now, it may add to it on the end by having to uh, prepare sites down the road, but it would reduce the initial cost. Uh, our equipment needs that are coming up. Uh, some of our equipment that we've been putting it on our lease program where we leasing it, 
It's also under a maintenance program where they provide, uh, you know, regular maintenance. Now, that does not include wear parts. That's something we still have to pay for, like undercarriages and things like that. Uh, something we need uh, is what we call a mobile surveillance camera at the work face. Uh, we need this to provide us with a recording that'll help with insurance claims, vandalism, and cause and location of fires. We are having fires because of the lithium ion batteries. We had one, I don't know if y'all remember, about a year and a half ago, uh, burned up the first shredder we had. And uh, so it'd be nice to have that, to, so we'd have a record of all that. Uh, if we go to landfill mining, we'd have to get a shredder and an excavator. Uh, we're in desperate need of a fuel truck and several pickup trucks. Everything we have is handy down. The newest pickup truck we got is a 2010 and it's used by the inmates. A fuel truck is pieced together from an old stormwater flatbed truck that we, we actually made to be the fuel truck. And matter of fact, it's down right now, waiting on a part to come in for it. Uh, the old pet track loader we got is a 1999 model. Just like me, it's old and wore out. We either need to spend a lot of money to fix it or replace it. So a lot of our equipment is old that we haven't replaced. Personnel. Huh? <laughs> I know. I know. We'll talk later. Now, right now, we have uh, the landfill, uh, um, landfill superintendent. Landfill superintendent. We have five equipment operators, which we actually only have four with one opening, and a scale attendant. This is the same number of employees we had when we were doing just 100 tons a day. Right now, we're doing over 400 tons a day, right at 400 tons a day. We're stretched. When anybody takes a vacation out, we don't have any people there. It, it puts a strain on everybody. Well, it went from 100 ton. It started increasing when we started becoming the lowest landfill around. And then it also has gone up because of the increase with the storm. You know, the storm happened in January. We're still doing 400 tons a day. So the, the vegetative debris, that's going to a separate spot. Though. That is correct. That is, matter of fact, the people are out there uh, now. So none of the tree debris that comes from yard waste or from trees down from the storm, all that goes to a separate spot. That is correct. That does not impact. That is correct. That is correct. And the 400 tons a day does not include uh, the uh, the company we had picking up the storm to be, I believe they were SDR was the company. That did not include their stuff. They didn't come across the scale because that was all handled by FEMA. So we that were, stuff. We were reimbursed for that. FEMA doesn't allow us to double dip. So if they were to go across the scales, and SDR working with us, we wouldn't have to put in the back out. So the whole intent of that operation was to make sure that we don't have the building debris that SDR picked up on the right of way. Yeah, that, that all of that will go through. You won't you won't think about revenue that we can consider as revenue. Um, but we are getting a reimbursement for SDR's operation itself. Um, but we can't double this so that that's really what that how long have um ha has it been that we had this number of employees at the landfill? I've been there ten years, and it's been that way. It's been the same way. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, you know, we personalize the forms this afternoon. We have in so, as we put 
the sort of space to bring the guy again the equipment that you need for Larry, give the equipment and equipment is going to drive, you know, you can make up, you can make up for the time which is there. You got probably the bad equipment in the last hole in the at that sort of same time. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Uh, so what does all this mean? Uh, we need to look at all revenues to raise funds in order to continue operating the landfill, including raising the gate rate and increasing tiered customers' rate. Uh, we have customers who, the more they bring in, the better rate they get. Uh, that definitely needs to go up, too, because they travel a long way to get a better rate. We're Quickly running out of space. The, land, the new landfill may not be ready when the current one is full. We need to start landfill mining as soon as possible. We need to establish a prior We need to prior tarp. I can't say that word. A list of equipment needs. And we need to evaluate our equipment and determine if we're going to repair it or replace it. Also, we need to uh, work with Paragon to come up with the cheapest and most efficient way to open the new landfill. We need to look at options to slowing down the amount of uh, waste we accept, including the possibility of closing on Saturday. And failure to act will result in the closing of the existing landfill without a place for customers to dump their C and D. So on the mining, so we got to be mining and do a new landfill, or do you think if we raise the rate, the we, 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 and the mining will keep us from having the building? We are at a point. We've almost waited too late. We're at a point that if we start landfill mining. We'll gain enough, we should gain enough time to get the new landfill open. It's a matter of, I don't think it's a question of whether or not you need a new landfill. If you want to be in the landfill business, you're going to have to build a new landfill. Um, it's just a matter of timing because right now, I don't think we have the ability to keep up with keeping this current one open until we get the new one open. So you're going to shut down for a while at this point, unless we do some landfill mining Pretty true, right? And, and the, the problem with the delay in opening the new landfill is uh, the Georgia EPD. They're so slow. Uh, Paragon has been going on, I guess, what a year now, trying to get the site suitability done for the existing for, for the new landfill. Yesterday, they tried to get it all uploaded into the Georgia EPD system called GEOS, and they had problems. So it's always a delay on, on their end, not on our end or the uh, Paragon's group. Okay, I, I, I didn't hear the last thing you said, but the mining, do we have to have certain permits in order to mine? That's what, that's what I'm working with. Yeah, it's oh. something really as well, so uh, it's as long as it's going to go across the country. I don't know if I have anything to call the service mine with it. It's where they go through and take the three or four stuff down. We're trying to do it. So that's why they're considered to see that. So the yeah. option of only dealing with city debris, city resident debris, building sites, and, and shutting the outside world out. We'll, we'll lose a whole lot of money. I understand. I'm just trying to 
That's at stock economic advice. We 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 still depending on our customer. So in order to run as a point, we have to be we have to run as we have to be able to work to run customer and shut down. So the 400 ton drops, it could be raised rates drops to 200 ton a day. Yeah, that's the same. Um, it's our key, our key customer is tax. We don't need to talk to me about it. And they're on a tiered rate. They aren't even paying the gate rate. Do we do contract with them or that's the that was That was established in the, uh, the rates. I believe as a gate rate, and I believe it's uh, however many tons you bring in, it's it's like four or five different levels, and they are at the they are the biggest customer. They get the biggest break, and yeah, but it's based on what we use it. they I think their current rate is they only paying like twenty three dollars a ton right now. Even with the tiered rate, if we if we increase what could we increase theirs? Yes, yeah. yes. So when is so are you just in your presentation at this point? I'm at the end of my presentation. So what is staff recommendation with regards to where we go from here, change our ordinance or to change our I don't think there's an ordinance change, change, or change our rate structure. Yes, we need to bring back with you a rate structure increase um, right. as well as we need to continue or we would like your blessing to continue to talk with EPD about landfill mining. Um, and really, this is for an update to let you know where we are. But we, we do need to bring back some some increased rates, unfortunately. And is there a possibility of a private sector? I, I know back. In the late 80s, not early 90s, there was a discussion about company coming in and taking over a landfill, taking the liability. Are we doing it? It's not the um, do that market the out there. Or contract not to the same problem. You don't have to ask. You gotta have to ask. As long as you got either increase the key revenue, increase revenue, then landfill is accepted. Right now, we have a point where we put all the back for so many years that now we have a point where we got two and a half, two point five, six million. But if we didn't maintain, do the service minus in five years, about to buy another year or two, they buy the time, even if you find a cruiser, we'll be just transition from one site to another. Not a problem, it's about having a proper hair streak and maintain. And raising that closure fees instead of being a dollar, it's going to be five dollars, ten dollars a ton. And that's right. that's what you're. Right. It, it needs to be raised. Revenue. And and just to let you know, if we continue the landfill mining with the existing site, uh, that closure fee would kind of go away for a while because it's got about twenty years worth of uh, material we can mine out of that. Or the new proposed landfill is what, 50 acres? It's 50 acres, but I think the actual landfill part will be 22, 23 acres because you got to have a buffer around the outside. Say that again. This right here is the last, if I'm not mistaken, the last remaining part we can use for a expansion. Once this goes in, and of course I'll be long gone. Uh, once that runs out, then the, I don't know what they'll do. Okay. Yes, sir. You guys probably don't know this, but I'm not an expert on landfills, so I will I'll wait. You know, I'll come back and let us know what the impact this will have on our ability to embrace what we got to do in order to keep. Uh, the service available to keep people um, employed and provide a service for our community. So thank you so much. For okay. Your, your well, detail. Those of y'all have who haven't been, I invite you out to the landfill, 575 Shoal Creek Road. Make sure you stop by the scale house because it's a dangerous place with a lot of traffic. I'll be happy to show you around. They charge to go the scale. Only you. Only, no. only, 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 yeah. only. Anything else that's a comment? No, that's a comment.
Thank you so much, right. Todd. Thank you very much. All right. Moving into item four, consider executive session to OCGA section 5014 for the purpose of discussing or deliberating upon the appointment, employment, compensation, hiring, disciplinary action, or dismissal, or periodic evaluation, or rating of a public officer or employee pursuant to OCGA section 5014 b for the purpose of authorizing negotiations to purchase, dispose of, or lease property pursuant to OCGA section 5014 for the purpose of conducting a meeting with legal counsel pertaining to pending and potential litigation, settlement claims, administrative proceedings, or other judicial actions brought or to be brought by or against the agency or any officer or employee or in which the agency or any officer or employee or any may be directly involved. Do we have a motion to go Yeah, Mr. Hensley with motion. Ms. Murray with a second. All in favor, please join us. Thank <laughs> you. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So, is the report of the motion to adjourn? Do we have a second? Ms. Morgan. Ms. Murray, the second. All in favor? Say bye. 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 bye.